Hello and welcome to the fourth Sunday in Lent. Next Sunday, April 3rd, after worship, we will be having our annual meeting downstairs in the church hall. Please plan to come along, bring a bag lunch, and coffee, tea, and cold drinks will be provided. It's going to be an important annual meeting as we look at the year gone by and as we talk about some options for future ministry. Also, uh, this Sunday evening in Sharon St. John Church at 7 o'clock, the Stellarton Ministerial will be hosting a prayer vigil for the people of the Ukraine. We wanted to provide a time of reflection and a place for prayer. So please come along at 7 on this Sunday evening. Also, for those who are wanting to join the church by profession of faith, or by transfer, or by reaffirmation of faith, an inquirer session is going to be held next Sunday, uh, that's April the 3rd, at 3 o'clock in the ladies' parlor. Let us now prepare to worship Almighty God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us look to God and let us pray. O gracious God, seeker of the lost, draw your children back to your loving embrace. Restore us to our inheritance as daughters and sons and reconcile our hearts to you that we may become ambassadors of your reconciling love to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Good morning. The scripture lesson this morning is taken from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32, the parable of the prodigal and his brother. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and, they, and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly! Bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, 
For all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and glorious Lord God, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds and bodies to the recreating power of your word, that we may see the world through the mind of Christ and live in the world as a foretaste of your new creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. President Calvin Coolidge, known for his brevity of speech, never used three words when one or two would suffice. We were talking about this just prior to this service. And one Sunday morning, he went to church without his wife. She wasn't feeling too good. The president returned to the White House, and Mrs. Coolidge asked what the sermon was about. Sin, Coolidge said. And what did the preacher have to say about sin, Mrs. Coolidge persisted. He was against it, her husband replied. A novelist was researching a book about life in New England during the first half of the 20th century, and he thought he might get some valuable insight while visiting a local cemetery. He soon discovered that almost all the tombstones erected during the period in question contained a short epitaph. Without exception, each epitaph had only words of praise for the deceased. Words like generous, kind, understanding, upstanding, noble, loving. And they prompted the researcher to ask, I wonder where they buried the sinners. In today's gospel lesson, a very familiar one to us, Luke tells us that when the Pharisees saw Jesus associating with certain types of undeserving people they felt superior to, they criticized him. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus to hear him, Luke says, and the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. These people were major sinners in the minds of the Pharisees, greedy extortionists, socially unacceptable, all of whom they despised. And should any of you be feeling even the slightest twinge of discomfort over Jesus' choice of companions, I have to remind you that he is among sinners here and now, because we're all sinners, we're all imperfect. <clears throat> There are no exceptions. And the more we try to cover up or gloss over that reality, the greater our culpability. In our self-righteousness, we self-destruct. The higher our claims of superiority soar, the lower we sink. In God's eyes, undeserving human beings never existed. In God's eyes, every human being is essential, no one more valuable than any other. It was the Austrian-born physicist Wolfgang Pauli, regarded by many experts to have one of the brightest, sharpest minds in all scientific history. He was exalted for his positive scientific achievements and his ability to spot errors in the scientific efforts of his colleagues. And after Wolfgang's death, one of his colleagues, 
memorialized him in this legend. It was not surprising that God had been waiting for Wolfgang to arrive. I presume, said God, that there is much in the world of physics that puzzled you on earth, and that you would welcome this opportunity for complete understanding now. Yes, Lord, Wolfgang replied, for to tell you the truth, I grew weary of watching my colleagues go wrong. For instance, I have always been disturbed that the proton has exactly 1,836.11 times the mass of the electron, though the electrical charges are the same. Why so odd a multiple as 1,836.11? There has to be a reason, God. But all the theories I've seen that try to resolve this question are wrong. And so, God says, I'll give you the answer in the current language of quantum mechanics. At which point, God handed Wolfgang a a sheaf of papers saying, here is your explanation. And Wolfgang took the papers and quickly looked through each sheet. And then he turned back to the first page, took a quick second look at the fourth, then handed them all back to God. Still wrong, he said with a sigh. Well, when God looks upon this world, he sees in the foreground the human picture, not statistics, not ideas, not things, but faces. And when God looks upon this world to his all-seeing eye, these billions of faces do not resolve themselves into a blur. When God looks upon this world, he sees mirrored in each face, a unique combination of ego and humility, dreams and disappointments, pleasures and pains. In other words, God loves us individually, one by one. On the level of our relationship with God, there are no favorites, no outcasts, no distinctions to be made between ins and outs, superiors and inferiors. Today's Gospel lesson, we find ourselves focused upon the prodigal son, and many biblical scholars have said that the parable of the prodigal son is a misnomer because it should be called perhaps the parable of the father's love or the parable of the prodigal father. The story's whole point is that the father is lavish in his love for his two sons, and he pours his love over both. We sometimes forget that there are two sons in the parable, and two parts to the story. The first part, of course, is about the younger son who goes off, takes his share of the inheritance, and, of course, he goes on a wild binge and he wastes his share. Uh, there was a little boy one time asked about that in Sunday school, and he said, yes, he said, he spent it all on partying and prostitutes and all kinds of things, and then, of course, he wasted some of the money, too. Kind of came out funny. When he comes home again, his father's love for him is poured out as usual. The father forgives and forgets and rejoices in the son's return. He says, I'll put the ring upon his finger. I'll put the, the robe upon him and we'll cook up the, the fatted calf and we will have a celebration, the reunion of father and son, the celebration, the preparation, the big feast, very dramatic and very moving. But the older son is rather sorry to see him come home. And the real point of the parable for 99% of us is the older brother's attitude. And this comes home to us when we look at some of 
St. Luke's Gospel verses that precede the prodigal son, we read in our Gospel that tax collectors and other sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus at the beginning of chapter 15. And the Pharisees and the scribes are murmuring, well, this man welcomes sinners, and, and, and he eats with them. And here were the respectable, proper, we might say church-going people murmuring <laughs> against Jesus because he was sharing the good news of God's love with those they thought to be undeserving, throwing the pearls, as it were, before swine. And we realize that Jesus told the parable for the people who were doing the murmuring. And we recognize that in the parable, the older brother was all those people. The older brother's conduct is impressive in that he stayed at home. He was a good boy. He worked hard. He was a respectable boy. He never ran off and wasted half his father's estate as the younger brother did. And yet, as it turns out, he was more deeply estranged from his father than the younger boy who went away. Certainly, as you read the story, you realize that the kind of life he was living led him to joyless, thankless, loveless living. He sees how warmly the father welcomes the younger son when he returns home. And for he says to his father, for years I've slaved for you, I've never disobeyed you, uh, I've never gone against your orders, yet you, you never gave me as much as a kid, a little goat to celebrate with my friends. And then when this son of yours, he can't even call him by his name, he says, this son of yours returns after having gone through your property. Well, you kill the fatted calf for him. The older brother is resentful, jealous, bitter, self-righteous, and the point of the story is that the father loves even this boy. It's easy to love the prodigal because he was an adventurer. He was a fun-loving fellow. He was repentant. He came back with his hat in his hand saying how sorry he was. Didn't even get a chance to get it out of his mouth that his father ran to meet him, swept him off his feet. Any father... Could have loved that boy. What's so great about that? Well, the significant part of this story is that the father loved his stay-at-home boy who was self-centered, sullen, and joyless just as much as he loved the prodigal who returned. And I think we need to ask ourselves, are we like that older brother? Many of us have been brought up in good homes and live decent, respectable lives. Some of us have been in our father's house all of our lives. But this doesn't mean that we haven't sinned. In many cases, our sins are more subtle maybe more dangerous, more destructive. We're right here in the Father's house, and yet sometimes we tend to live joyless, thankless, and loveless lives. So many do. We have to look around us. We're a beautiful-looking people. We like each other when it comes down to bread-and-butter things, the deep inner peace, the wholeness of life, the joy, the love, the superabundant kind of sensitive love that means we care for another person. We have to, we have to continue in our struggle in the Christian faith. We have to continue in our quest to be disciples. 
it's so easy to become estranged from God to some degree, and this is what Lent uh, is teaching us. It's teaching us to reflect, to examine ourselves very closely. And the good news, the good news is that God loves even us. So don't be too hard on yourself. God loves you. God loves even those of us who have been in the Father's house living decent, respectable lives, but can still miss the whole point of his love and still responding to his lavish gifts with so little joy and sometimes with so little love. What does God think of sin? Well, to sum up in Coolidge's words, he's against it. And yet, though we are all sinners, he loves us. He loves us all the time. And he wants us to come home. Thanks be to God for the victory which is ours. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. look to God in prayer. Each of the petitions will end with the words, let us pray to the Lord. And the response will be, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Gracious Lord God, we pray for the church throughout the world, that all Christians may embody the reconciling love of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the nations of the world and its leaders, that all may dwell in peace, and that justice may be tempered by mercy. We pray for those in the Ukraine who suffer such destruction and violence, for the many families of the many victims of this senseless war. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for the planet Earth, God's gift to humankind, that all may share wisely its resources and conserve its riches for our children's children. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. And we pray, Lord, O God, for our enemies, that we may regard them with the reconciling love made manifest in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are sick or in trouble, for the defenseless, the weak, and the poor, that they may be restored to wholeness of life and livelihood, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the lost, for those who have abandoned God, friends, or family, and for those who have never known such love, that they may come to know the joy of God's embrace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O loving God, hear the prayers of your people for the sake of our world and our Savior Jesus Christ, through whom we pray, saying, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy Lord, kingdom come. Thy will, will be, be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily, daily bread. bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Go forth as ambassadors for Christ, in whom we have new life. And the God of reconciliation bless you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you, and the power of the Holy Spirit strengthen you this day and forevermore. Amen. Yeah.
Thank you. 